Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, the first of its kind co-branded webinar between the Canadian Orthopedic Association, Ortho Evidence, and Canadian Arthroplast uh, Arthroplasty Society. Uh, the idea behind this webinar it was really created to, with a specific focus uh, on, on uh, trying to reach topics that would find people outside of the uh, major academic centers. Um, but before we get started, I would like to begin by acknowledging that I'm on the traditional unceded territory of the Silix Okanagan people. I do recognize that my fellow moderators and panelists may be on different territories than myself, but we as a group value uh, the significant historical and contemporary contributions of local and regional First Nations of Turtle Island. So this topic we're about to dive into has been a hot topic for years now, uh, but for, for surgeons such as myself, who are actually subspecialty so trained in other areas, still do arthroplasty, the, the pressure is, is really actually starting to rise. Patients are actually coming into my office now requesting the anterior approach, asking if I'm going through muscle, and then actually asking me to be re referred on to someone else uh, who may consider doing this. So that, that's really where the pressures are right now. So tonight we'll go through some of the epidemiology as well as some real life experiences from, from, some, uh, from our moderators as well as our speakers. And then we're gonna leave ample time at the end uh, for questions. So please don't hesitate to put your questions down uh, in the Q&A sections. Uh, the moderators will keep an eye on this section throughout the entire, um, the entire webinar. So now I'd like to introduce our moderators and uh, presenters. Uh, so Dr. James Howers is from Calgary, Alberta, uh, completed residency at the University of Western Ontario, and then completed a trauma fellowship at Harborview in Seattle, followed by joint reconstruction at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. He's currently an associate professor and the program director for the orthopedic residency at Western University. So welcome, James, and thanks for being here. After that would be Lisa Howard. Uh, Lisa is an assistant professor at the University of British Columbia, specializes in uh, hip and knee arthroplasty. She completed med school and residency out at UBC and then uh, did the fellowship in reconstructive orthopedics. Uh, she now has a master's in clinical epidemiology and works uh, with the UBC and Vancouver General Hospital Academic Centers and the residency program there. Uh, Lisa, thanks for being here. Next on to Raj. Raj Sharma is an assistant professor for uh, out of the University of Calgary, uh, operates out of the Peter Lougheed Hospital. Uh, he's the arthroplasty research lead in Calgary and is an active member uh, of the resident and fellow hip and knee uh, reconstruction teaching group. Uh, here with me in this room uh, are Dr. Stephen Sylvester and Ross Demko, who will give us a little real life experience. So Stephen Sylvester uh, is a trauma and uh, arthroplasty subspecialty trained. Uh, he completed his uh, training at a Sunnybrook uh, Health Sciences Center in 2015. Uh, he lives out here with us in uh, Kelowna with his wife and three kids and uh, uh, is a, uh, a key um, uh, uh, leader in the uh, direct entry approach here. Uh, and his counterpart, uh, Dr. Ross Demko, uh, is originally out of Calgary, uh, completed orthopedic residency in Dalhousie, um, and then uh, fellowship training at the University of Minnesota in trauma and arthroplasty at the University of Manitoba. He's been practicing uh, uh, alongside both uh, Steve and I since uh, 2015 here in Kelowna uh, with a practice uh, mostly focused on hip and knee arthroplasty. So with that introduction, I will, uh, I will pass it on uh, to Dr. James Howard. Thanks very much, Lane. Welcome, everybody. And I think we're uh, hopefully in for a great night tonight, diving into uh, looking at these novel approaches to the hip and trying to understand if, if the outcomes warrant learning a new approach in a non-academic setting. Uh, these are my disclosures uh, uh, related to, none of them are really, really related to this talk. In terms of my approach disclosures, I was trained as a lateral surgeon, uh, as a resident, uh, primarily in, at the Mayo as a fellow. I did posterior with some lateral and I've taken up DA about five years in the practice. So I'm probably about a decade into doing it at this point. And I still use all three approaches in my, in my practice today. So I'm just gonna try to set the land, uh, lay the land a bit for our, our speakers. Um, we all know total hip is a very effective treatment for OA. Uh, we're up to over 60,000 cases a year uh, done uh, in Canada with a significant cost to the healthcare uh, system. We all know there's a variety of surgical approaches, and I would imagine most of us uh, on the webinar tonight were trained in, in one or the other of the, the more traditional approaches, be that posterior or lateral as residents, and that's usually where we got our grounding in, in total hips. Uh, but more and more, you're seeing other approaches, and in particular today, we're going to be discussing the anterior approach and its relationship to where it might fit in your practice. And the key question is, does it matter what approach you do in, in 2022? 
And really, should you consider change, changing your current practice? I made this slide probably about five or six years ago when I was uh, doing a talk on surgical approaches. And it shows just sort of the spectrum of, of, of how approaches were at that time. There's a difference between Canada and international. Internationally, there's a little bit more of a split between uh, lateral and posterior with a slight edge towards posterior. And DA was occupying about 10% of the, of, the, of the pie. In Canada, as often, we, we adopt things a little bit slower than some other, program, other uh, countries. And so DA is much less than it was at the time in, in Canada. Uh, and lateral was actually the dominant approach as many of the training programs sort of uh, have focused on that uh, over the years. Now, if you look over time, though, across multiple countries, this is just an example from the most recent data from the Australian Joint Replacement Registry, anterior and other approaches such as the, these novel approaches are taking up more and more of the uh, segment of the population that are getting total hips. So in this data, the, the anterior approach occupies 28% of the, of the data from 2021. Now, just quickly, I think we're all probably familiar with these approaches, but just to review what we're talking about, the posterior approach is not a new thing. It's been popularized for a number of years, originally by Moore in the 1950s. Your incision is going to be basically something like this, uh, centered over the trochanter and curving posteriorly. Your intervals is going to involve splitting uh, G-max and coming then down onto the short external rotators, either taking them all off or uh, trying to maintain piriformis, depending on, on the approach that you're using. Your at-risk structure being the sciatic nerve is relatively close proximity on this approach. The advantages of this exposure, it gives very extensile exposure for both acetabulum and femur, and it does spare the abductors. Historically, the, the knocks against it would be the dislocation rate, and historically any from 1% to 5%, and the possibility of a sciatic nerve palsy or injury associated with, uh, with the surgery. Now, looking at the dislocation rate, certainly we have had multiple complications that have shown that that does improve with a good posterior capsular repair, and certainly uh, other implant issues such as head size can play a role in that. For the lateral approach, this originally came out of Europe in the 1980s. Uh, for your intervals, your incision is generally more centered over the trochanter with no, no curve posteriorly. It's more in line with the femur. Uh, you're going to split through tensor fascia lata and then some varying degree of split of the abductors, be that a 50-50 split or an anterior one-third, post, uh, posterior two-thirds uh, split, depending on surgeon preference. This also provides very uh, extensile exposure uh, and does uh, boast a very low dose dislocation rate, relatively more independent of head size than the posterior approach. The disadvantages, though, is it does take down the abductors and abductor issues can be anywhere from 4 to 20% patients and the potential for palsies, be that superior gluteal nerve or femoral to exist. With regards to the anterior approach, it's not a new surgical approach. It's just become more popular recently to, to do total hips. Uh, your interval involves an incision, usually curving slightly laterally uh, just off of the ASIS. Uh, it is an internervous intermuscular plane between sartorius TFL, which brings you down fairly quickly onto the capsule. And then you can proceed from that point with, uh, with the total hip. If you go across the literature or, or dare to search Google and go on the internet, you're going to see a lot of things about the anterior approach written. Is it, is it more muscle sparing? Does this show uh, more early restoration of function? Is it a better dislocation rate? And this is some of what our speakers are going to touch on today. We'll also look at the potential disadvantages. Is there a higher risk of, of femur fractures or femoral complications? More wound issues, lateral femoral cutaneous neuropraxias? Is it just harder to do and more technically demanding? And, and does it actually cost more in your operating room, even if it saves the overall hospital stay? You are potentially, are you gonna add fluoro in? Are you gonna buy a whole new table to do this procedure? All of these things are things that you might consider if you're potentially switching approaches. So I think it can be daunting when you think I might be changing my table. I might add fluoro into a procedure that I already know how to do. I'm going to use a new interval, maybe new reamers, maybe new brooches and potentially a new implant. And so when you think about that, that can be something that's a bit scary to, to a surgeon to, to go into. So in the talks tonight, as you listen to our speakers, I want you to think about some things when you listen to the comparison of the approaches. Think about the outcomes, be those both early and late. Think about the costs uh, to your hospital in terms of the operating room costs, as well as the hospital stay. Think about what complication rates and is it different than what you're gonna experience with your current approach? And then the concept of learning curve. And I will point out as I'm sure um, Raj might, might agree, there's, it's not really a nice gentle curve. It's more of a rocky mountain going up and down uh, as you learn anything in, in orthopedics. So we'll hear about his experience uh, in teaching and learning this. 
So our overall objective is to try to give you a bit of a summary of current data comparing DA posterior and lateral approaches, looking at the hospital staff, proms and complications. We're breaking that down into three different talks tonight. Uh, Lisa, Dr. Lisa Howard's gonna try to present the case for maintaining the status quo, meaning what you've been trained to do is what you should persevere with. And, and that's what you do well and you should continue doing that. Raj uh, Sharma from Calgary is gonna present the case for potentially considering change if you haven't gone down this road and specifically with regards to the direct anterior approach. And we'll touch on uh, through the discussion how to transition if this is something you wanna do with new technology protocols or a new approach. And then uh, Dr. Demko and Sylvester out of uh, Kelowna are gonna try to present some real world experience to all of you about how they successfully transition to a new approach and uh, find out how you might do that in a non-academic center. Uh, so I think that's where I'm gonna stop in terms of introducing things. And uh, Lisa, I'm gonna hand it over to you to give our first talk about uh, maintaining the status quo. Let me just get uh, my screen shared and we will get going. Okay, someone just let me know if anyone can't see that. So uh, thanks for the uh, in kind introduction. I'm Lisa Howard. Um, I've already been introduced, so I won't belabor any of that. And I'm a surgeon here in Vancouver, and I'm going to talk to you about why you should maintain your status quo. Uh, disclosures, in terms of industry, I don't have anything that's relevant to this talk. Um, my approach disclosure, I am a posterior approach surgeon. That's how I was trained, and that's what I continue to do today. So I'm going to start with a, a you know broad opening statement here. The anterior approach, the posterior lateral approach, the direct lateral approach are all very acceptable ways to do a hip replacement. And as as um, Jamie referred to, they are highly successful. Most of the patients do well. Uh, there is a ton of literature on on this topic, and it can't be uh, covered in eight to ten minutes. But I will do my best to give a, a best overview of some of the studies that I think paint this picture. Much of the evidence is conflicting. What I present, you're gonna probably know of a paper that says something different, and that's the way that this, this evidence goes. There's really not a perfect study that answers this question. So just keep that in mind as we, uh, as we go through. So your overall question that you're keeping in mind as well as some of the other things that Jamie talked about, but the big question here is, should I be changing my approach to something different? So let's jump right into the registry studies. Now, trials are good, but they're, uh, they're not perfect in terms of what the you know, real world, right? That's more what a registry is a representative about. So this is from the Australian registry, 122, roughly 1000 hips, you can see the delineation of the different subtypes, they're mostly posterior, but a fair bit lateral and anterior. Um, what they looked at and what they showed, uh, actually, uh, was that uh, the DA uh, approach was associated with a higher rate of revisions requiring reoperations when they compared it to the posterior lateral approach. So you can see the hazard ratio there, and that was um, significant, as well as the lateral. And I'll just go through some of these graphs that they showed. So what they, you see this, um, this green line here, or green line there, sorry, uh, shows that there's a higher rate of femoral loosening. Uh, this is over the course of the first three years uh, compared to both the uh, lateral approach as well as the posterior approach. They found that to be significant. There was a higher rate of femoral fracture in the first three months, most notably at the beginning. Um, and that was again compared uh, to the uh, posterior and the lateral approach and was significant. They found a higher rate of infection actually with the um, uh, posterior lateral and the uh, lateral approach compared to the DA. So something different than some of the advantages maybe that we've talked about before. And again, that was uh, significant. And they found a higher rate of dislocation with the posterior approach compared to the DA and the DL, which again was significant and really not surprising. So they did not factor in surgeon experience though and implant choice so there were some holes in this in this registry it didn't, that's what I, what I mean when i say it doesn't really answer all the questions they only had a short follow-up of about three years so it doesn't really address everything there you got to take that with a bit of a, a grain of salt the registries battle each other too depending on what registry you look at the results are going to be slightly different so this is an example of the norwegian registry uh, they found that the overall revision rates um, and risk of revision between da pl and dl was actually very similar they didn't really find a difference but the specific things infection is greater in the lateral approach and dislocation was greater in the posterior lateral approach which again dislocation is not really surprising but now we see infection in lateral 
versus the post year in, in, in the previous registry. And if you go through the other registries, the Swedish, the, um, um, the uh, English, the uh, New Zealand, you know, they all have subtly different findings. None of them really totally agree with each other. This was a, um, an article done by some of our Canadian colleagues, Dan, uh, Dan Pincus, uh, one of our previous fellows as well. And uh, what they looked at was uh, the uh, anterior approach and how it performs in Ontario. So they found that the DA was associated with a greater risk of surgical complication in the first year, mainly with infection and dislocation requiring revision. They did point out, though, that the DA had shorter length, uh, length of stay, and they did this as a propensity match. So they, they did quite a, a, a vigorous match with lots of different covariates here. Uh, this is a this is the, um, the the chart really that they showed uh, with their main finding of the study. So you can see there that the, the cumulative um, revision of, of the anterior approach compared with the lateral or the uh, posterior, which uh, was part of the uh, propensity match. As you can see that it's higher in, in the anterior approach. Uh, they did factor in hospital and surgeon volume in some of their covariates. So they, you know, they, they concluded that it's not just a learning curve here. There may be some actual aspects of the surgery, which, which influence things. Um, but they didn't really have any information regarding short-term functional outcomes and pain scores. And that's what I'm going to get into next. Um, specific implants, again, weren't recorded. The lateral cutaneous nerve injury and periprosthetic fracture were not really assessed. And those are two of the things we talk about with the anterior approach. So um, again, great study shows some things, but there's, again, some holes in it, which is, uh, you know, common uh, with these, with these studies. This is a really commonly uh, quoted study. So this was the, um, or the, the, the pig nano pig paper, as well as um, Mar uh, Michael Taunton. So this was an RCT DA versus um, posterior lateral. Uh, they did a, a a really sophisticated functional assessment with, uh, with sensors that they placed and, and collected over two weeks, eight weeks, one year. Um, they only did high volume surgeons. There was no learning curve cases involved. Uh, you know, there were some findings, which is not surprising. The DA took longer. That doesn't surprise really anyone here. They didn't find a difference in the functional outcomes between the approaches, but they weren't powered for that finding. So you have to take that with a bit of a grain of salt. Uh, no difference in the radiographic outcomes and the post and the uh, complications were about the same between the, the two groups different types of complications, but the overall uh, the same. What they did find was that the early functional status within the DA was uh, uh, was improved. So walking without a walker, without aid, stopping narcotics, stairs with the aid, walking six blocks, those things were improved with the DA compared to the um, uh, posterior, lateral, posterior lateral approach. And in, the other thing is that they found that morphine equivalents were less with the DA compared to the posterior lateral approach. So the, this, you know, suggests that there might be some initial benefit with respect to pain control, as well as you know, the very initial functional uh, recovery. So now we turn to the, the systematic review. So, you know, there, there are several trials, pros, prospective studies, and again, you have to take all of them and read all of them and understand what each of them is trying to tell you and what each of them can tell you. So when we look at these systematic reviews, much like the registries, they don't all agree with each other either. So this was um, uh, the Miller uh, systematic review looked at the anterior versus posterior, no learning curve cases. They included 13 studies and a good methodology there. So they found again, lower pain severity with, with the DA with the low heterogeneity of those results. You can see the forest plot above there. And then uh, lower narcotic usage as well with the DA with low to moderate uh, heterogeneity. Uh, greater hair, Harris hip scores with the DA through to 90 days. You start getting more heterogeneous there though in, in your results. So um, taking that with a bit of a grain of salt and no difference in any one complication. Interestingly, as you can see here, dislocation actually higher in the anterior group, which is not necessarily what you'd be expecting for this, but uh, that's what it showed, but no difference in the overall uh, complications. Another meta-analysis here, this is a more recent one. And in contrast to the one I just showed you, no difference in Harris hit scores at three, six or 12 months, no difference in pain on post-op day one, no difference in post-operative complications. So you're seeing a stark difference to what uh, we just concluded there. And then uh, yet another systematic review, I won't go through all the details just for the uh, sake of time here, but the, these authors, again, I'm paraphrasing here, but concluding that you know, due to the available evidence currently now, uh, in this paper, at least, they couldn't conclude superiority of one approach over the other. So that's a common theme that you'll see. Uh, so where does that leave us? You know, you're looking at these registry studies, you're looking at the trials, you're looking at everything else, and one tells you one, one tells you another. And I think that that's an effect of a really uh, effect of a really highly studied topic. The same thing goes for injections in 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 knees, right? So you can see that with that particular topic, there's tons of literature, but no really clear 
answer. And I think that's where we are with the with the approaches, because I don't think there is really a clear answer. And I'm going to get into uh, what I mean by that. There's bias involved in this discussion, no matter which way you cut it. There's going to be patient bias, there's going to be surgeon bias, and in some scenarios, maybe less so in the Canadian system, but there is going to be some industry bias as well. It's there. You have to acknowledge it. So this is a great study and it was published in the Journal of Arthroplasty and it actually looked at some of uh, the internet searching uh, for this, uh, for the uh, DA versus um, the um, posterior as well as the, the lateral approach. So it looked at um, the uh, AUKUS and basically what where the searches went to when you Googled something within this group. So there was 1,855 internet sites, you know, most of them promoting DA or at least 22.8%, much less so for the other two approaches. A lot of numbers on this slide, but basically what it shows is that there's lots of skewed reporting for the benefits and the, and you see a lot of the, the proposed benefit and the things that um, you know were mentioned before less tissue damage potentially less pain faster recovery etc with very little linking to peer-reviewed articles that either support the risks or the, the benefits and really what they concluded was that there was a, a lot of promotion of the benefits and it was reported nine times more than any of the risks and that was significant um, the marketing promotes the benefits but doesn't really outline the modesty of, of some of these benefits right because there's a difference between statistically significant and clinically significant. And we're going we're gonna to come up to that uh, as well. It may be different with surgeon-specific outcomes. A lot of the papers where you see a clear benefit for the anterior approach are single surgeon studies, right? So what does that necessarily tell you about this? So they conclude that the, you know, again, paraphrasing, but the promise of a, of a quick recovery with the DA might be tied to marketing, which may come uh, paint an incomplete picture. And I think this ties to what uh, Lane says at the beginning of patients coming in with this information. That's what they're reading out there. So it's of no surprise to any of us that that's what they're uh, coming in with. I refer to these as Olympic differences. And it goes back to my initial or my initial point uh, on one of my first slides here. I think all three approaches are excellent approaches. And it really is the difference between gold and silver here. Does that justify a learning curve? Does that justify exposing patients to potentially increased risk at the beginning when the difference is gonna be basically the same in the end? And that's really what the question is that comes down to it. You know, the question may be asked, well, why are we as surgeons so resistant to change? Those of us who have done the lateral and the posterior approach forever, you know, are we, are we basically dinosaurs? Hence that this picture, are we thinking in the old ways? Are we not embracing the, the new literature? And while I think we do have to consider this as a factor, I think we also need to put a lot of stock into our mentors and what they did and what they have success with, right? Because our mentors, at least my mentors, uh, you know, they've been around for a long time. They've been through this iteration a few times with, with different approaches and they've stuck with the posterior approach. And these are academic surgeons and there has to be a reason for that, right? So I think that, you know, the, the um, our, our senior colleagues who are sticking to their guns, I think there's is something to be said for that. So just keep that in mind. But having said that, we should also explore change and uh, assess it properly. Do I think the evidence supports change for those with, with an established approach? In my opinion, no. I don't think there's enough evidence to show that there's a clear benefit without a uh, risk of um, uh, complications in, in the beginning. So I'm going to give you my, my takeaway here. And I wanted to present you with an overview that that had, you know, some of a, of a bit of both, because reality is, is that I think there's benefits to both approach. Uh, about both approaches, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say that there's nothing good about the anterior approach because there is, I just don't think the magnitude is such that warrants a, a, a switch. So this is a highly studied topic without a clear benefit, I think past the initial recovery period, which I don't think warrants enough to, to change the actual approach. There may be less pain. Um, and an improved functional recovery with the DA in the post-op period. And I think posterior surgeons probably have to recognize that because they think that that is likely to be an actual finding, but again, conflicting in the evidence, but it seems to come up more often than not. The overall complications are, are no different. So, and I think that's what I try to tell my patients when they ask me these questions, you're going to get the overall similar complication rate. It's just the types of complications are going to be different different. Posterior lateral is going to have more dislocations. And even with large head sizes, we're seeing less of that with the posterior approach, but it's probably always going to come down to being a little bit higher. The DA is always going to have more lateral femoral continuous nerve injuries, maybe fractures and aseptic loosening. We'll see as those registry, registry studies follow, uh, take us out further as to whether or not that's an actual finding. And the lateral approach is going to have patients that limp and, and chronic abductor problems. They are all going to have each of their own types. So it just, it's really, which one do you wanna be uh, dealing with? Patient perception matters. And this goes to what Lane was saying before. 
their their opinion and, and their perceived um, opinion of what treatment they're getting has a big factor on this, right? So if you have a patient that is fixed on a DA, they want a DA, their friend had it, their everyone else had it, they know of, they should see a surgeon who does that approach because that's what they're going to be happy with is getting the approach that they are fixed on, if, especially if you can't um, change their minds. Uh, bottom line, I don't think there's a compelling argument to switch from conventional to uh, the DA or any other minimally invasive approach. I think the status quo delivers a highly reproducible operation, great success. I think at the end of the day, you should do what you do and do it well. Thanks, everybody. That's great. Thanks very much, Lisa. So um, just um, a reminder, everybody, to use the, the chat function to ask questions. We'll have time at the end to, to go through a lot. I'm just going to ask a, a quick question of you, Lisa. I think that was a, a great summary. Um, you did go into the registry uh, data um, showing how each complication is a little bit different based on the approach. The overall revision rate in uh, that registry is no different, though, right? It's basically all three approaches have out to five years a similar revision rate in the Australia registry. It's just why they have yeah. to have revision. Yes, yes, exactly. I, I probably could have made that more clear. It's it's the you know the the they they do say that in the in the early time period that there's a skew towards the anterior approach, but by the time you come out of that initial period, then it, it plateaus and it, it's all the same. By, so the overall five years, five years is no difference. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so far. So my yeah. question, my question to you, um, you know, with the audience, you know, considering a non-academic setting, do you think it matters if their traditional approach was trained posterior or their traditional approach was trained lateral? Because, you know, these patients, I get, as Lane sort of outlined her, they kind of want, they've heard, I want it, I want it to be up quick and out of hospital quicker. Do you think it matters what your primary approach is? You focus mostly on posterior. You mean in terms of being able to switch to an anterior approach? Does it? A lateral surgeon considering a change to anterior versus a posterior surgeon changing to anterior. Do you think that's a different mindset or approach or it's exactly the same? I, I do. And I, and I didn't go into that a lot because there's, there's, there's not enough time, but there's a whole subset that we could do between the lateral approach and the posterior versus the anterior. And um, again, not a criticism to the, the lateral approach. I know it's really commonly done and, and a lot of people do it, but I have to say some of the most unhappy patients in my practice are the ones with abductor insufficiency that limp and they have pain and there's not much you can do for that problem. Right. So, uh, you know, I, I would say that you, it's maybe a more compelling argument from a lateral surgeon to switch to an anterior or posterior approach for that matter, but coming out of that lateral to do one of those two, than it is from a post your approach surgeon to switch to an anterior. I, th I think there's maybe less drive. And I know that the, the dislocations are, are, and again, I just accept this, they're always going to be higher for a posterior, even with greater head size. I just accept that that's probably the reality. But for the most part, I can fix that. If they get infected, sure, there's other things that can happen, but I can fix that, right? So anyways, to answer your, your question there, Jamie, I, I think there's probably more compelling evidence to go from a lateral pro approach to anterior. And you may be a perfect person to speak on that because that's basically what you did, so. Okay, fair enough. Well, well, we'll, we'll touch on some more points in the main question and answer, but I wanna give Raj the chance to, uh, to summarize his thoughts uh, on the direct anterior uh, and why you might wanna consider changing this uh, in your practice, Raj. Perfect. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, you're all, okay. you're all good. Excellent. All right. First of all, thank you for uh, um, uh, inviting me to to talk about this. It's uh, I, I definitely agree with uh, Dr. Lisa Howard that this is a uh, highly researched and, uh, and when something is highly researched, you have a lot of opinions on it. So uh, my goal here is to talk about the anterior approach and why. So uh, those are my disclosures. Um, so. First of all, thanks to the COA, Ortho Evidence, and uh, CAS for inviting me to, to talk about this. It's an area of, of my passion. I would say 98% uh, of all um, total hips that I perform are, are anterior now. Um, I have uh, com almost completely made that uh, transition. Um, uh, and uh, just like Dr. Lisa Howard said, uh, nothing's black and white. There's lots of controversy in the literature. Uh, there's always benefits and downsides. You gotta kind of decide on your own. Now, I was given the opportunity to talk uh, kind of eight minutes in total on, on anterior approach and the transition. 
which I think is important, not, not really possible. So I'm going to focus more on the entry approach and hopefully in the, in the Q&A, I can talk about the transition. But uh, really, once you see the results, you become an addiction. And, you know, I had the, I had the unique opportunity and privilege to, to work with Dr. Jamie Howard. Uh, he was one of my uh, fellowship preceptors. And if you don't uh, recognize this, this is Dr. Howard. This is what he looks like when he's finished his anterior hips uh, and he's all excited about it. Um, so, uh, jumping into this uh, uh, introduction, you know, medicine is practice today is virtually unrecognizable from the turn of the century. Things are going to continue to change. And the question is, how do you make a really good operation even better? And that's what we're talking about today. I'm going to talk about the anterior approach. I'm not going to jump at this too much because uh, Dr. Howard already spoke about it. But the anterior approach is the intranervous and intramuscular approach uh, to the hip. Uh, and between tensor fascia sartorius superficially and rectus and, and tensor fascia deep. Now, I believe the true value of the anterior approach is not necessarily the, uh, the um, obturator internus or their conjoint of the piriformis, but I really believe it's the preservation of both the posterior capsule and the IT band, uh, which is where you see the, the real benefits. Uh, just like Dr. Howard said, this is not new since the 1940s is uh, when this is, uh, has been started. It's just popularized now because of better uh, instrumentations and teaching programs. It can be it can be performed both with a table and without a table. You don't need to know use new implants. Um, that's a common thought that people have. Now, the, the biggest issue when you look at the literature about the anterior approach uh, to assess the value is the inconsistency of the approach. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, people will try to compare cemented and uncemented cups and stems, uh, whether you use x-rays, whether you don't use fluoroscopy, uh, whether you use a table, whether you, use, you don't use the table. Then they try to compare, uh, um, uh, in the ideal circumstance, you would compare a 32 or 36 uh, femoral heads with the 32 or 36 femoral heads of a different approach, but that's not really what the literature has. You have to d dive into the actual studies to realize sometimes they're comparing 32 and 36 anterior approach heads with 40 millimeters of dual mobility. Uh, heads on the poster approach. So you really got to know what you're trying to compare when you read the literature. And I, I really encourage you to look at the papers when, you, uh, when you're assessing it. Uh, what I'm going to try to advocate for here is uh, really using the anterior approach with fluoroscopic assessment. And I'll, and I'll jump into that as to why. Now, there's lots of benefits on my personal biased uh, opinion, if you want to put it that way, because uh, I really do believe in the anterior approach. Um, and there's lots of benefits, and there are some downsides, and I do acknowledge that. And uh, because of the constraint of time, I'm going to focus pretty much on three areas, pain, um, increased function stability, and uh, radiographic assistance. And some of that, um, uh, Dr. Lisa Howard's already kind of alluded to as well. Um, but in terms of pain, it's, it's extremely important because, you know, it's one of the most feared post-operative issues for patients. Uh, and it can be managed with any approach if you use multimodal analgesia, pre-operative counseling, et cetera. But really, in terms of pain, uh, if you really want to understand it, you don't only need to understand what the subjective patient reporting is, but you also need to objectively try to quantify exactly how much narcotics they're, uh, they're, they're using to achieve that comfort. And, and the combination of those two you really get to understand how the approach affects differences in, in terms of patients. Now, less pain means a more comfortable patient, quicker recovery, less nausea, better patient experience. Um, thanks to ortho evidence for providing some of these uh, uh, these slides here. But uh, you know, this uh, ACE report uh, showed lower pain with the direct anterior approach versus the lateral approach. Um, and what this paper looked at was 70 patients, uh, all using 32 millimeter uh, femoral heads, same implants, same multimodal analgesia. They measured uh, a seromyoglobin to look at markers of muscle damage and pain scores. And what they basically found, and I'm going to try to summarize this as quick as I can, is the anterior approach was associated with a significantly smaller increase in myoglobin levels, in other words, less tissue disruption, lower pain in the first postoperative day, and lower perioperative morphine consumption when compared to the direct lateral approach. This is a study that we did, uh, a retrospective matched cohort study with 115, uh, um, sorry, 120 uh, anterior approach with uh, 240 poster and 240 lateral approach. And looking at specifically narcotic consumption, we showed that there was a significant uh, decrease in total uh, narcotic consumption during the acute inpatient hospital stay. But when you look at total narcotic consumption, assuming that uh, we, we, uh, we place our threshold for clinically meaningful difference of reduction in, in narcotic consumption at 30%, it was over 400% reduction, which was quite significant. Now, jumping into my first, my second area, increased uh, early function and stability. You know, ultimately, you know, as Dr. Lisa Howard said, all total hips eventually do well, but really the demands of patients are changing and we need to acknowledge that early functional recovery and improved stability are strongly desired. And that trails not only from post-op day one, but continues on afterwards, whether you want to call that a patient bias, uh, a surgeon bias. Uh, or a bias of having less pain initially and continuing that positive outlook. It depends on how you want to see it. Um, 
And the value of soft, soft tissues are extremely important. For example, the IT band is, is an extremely important internal rotator, hip abductor, it holds the pelvis level. Uh, and it's logical if you preserve the IT band, you'll get better results. Now, unfortunately, there's no real good studies to assess specifically the IT band, but we do know, for example, the posterior capsule, um, uh, if you repair the posterior capsule, there's many studies and systematic reviews and meta-analyses uh, showing uh, um, that if you repair it, it reduces the risk of dislocation with the posterior approach. But it's interesting when you see this uh, JS article in 2019 showing that even the posterior approach of those with capsule repair, just under 50% of those capsule, fail, capsule repairs eventually fail uh, when looking at it through an MRI, which increases the risk of dislocation through the posterior approach. Um, looking at specifically at the anterior approach, this is a, a, a 2021 article that we looked at uh, uh, just under 800 uh, posterior approach patients with uh, 690 anterior approach patients. Uh, no dual mobility uh, heads were used here. I try to compare uh, two even groups. And the risk of post-operative dislocation was lower in the anterior approach um, uh, when, uh, and even in those with higher risk patients. And a study in March of 2021 uh, showed that when you look at that higher risk patients, for example, those uh, who have displaced femoral neck fractures, um, anterior approach still had a lower risk of dislocating. Uh, in terms of early uh, functional recovery, this ACE report uh, uh, basically looked at about 128 patients. Uh, they excluded the first 100 anterior approach ca uh, cases to remove this concept of uh, the learning curve. And uh, what they basically looked at, they demonstrated significantly shorter length of stay, lower pain scores over the first uh, three days after surgery, and higher functional scores in the, worst, in the first three months after surgery. They also identify longer operative time and greater blood loss. Now, jumping into this, I was curious exactly how much operative time. It was 18 minutes longer uh, to do the actual operation and 42 uh, mils of uh, blood loss. Now, um, 18 minutes is, is, is about right for what uh, my experience was personally when I first started it. Uh, now it's, it's completely the same. Um, what that meant, though, was it still could do the same number of cases in a day. It just means the, end, and the actual end time of your day versus finishing early. Length of stay, I'm not going to jump into this because this is a 30-minute talk on its own, which I'm always happy to do. But uh, all I have to say is anterior approach is just one way to achieve early success uh, for, for reducing length of stay in day surgery. But there's many other ways, and I'm going to acknowledge the fact that protocol-driven, um, uh, um, uh, better uh, nausea, um, and, and et cetera, are different ways to achieve it as well. But anterior approach, just to put it out there, is one way to achieve uh, um, success in terms of day surgery, total hip replacements. Now, in terms of the third area, radiographic assistance, um, I think anterior approach uh, is a very easy way to get intraoperative assessment uh, with fluoroscopic assistance. And what that means is you can get accurate leg length offset, femoral uh, stem size, acetabular cup uh, placement. Um, you can view in case you have intraoperative uh, uh, complications like fractures, you can deal with it if you see it at the time versus having to find it afterwards. And then you can add on other things like adjuncts, for example, navigation or print out overlays to make the hip replacement even more accurate. I honestly believe gone should be the day that we have these, uh, this x-ray is a post-operative image. And say to yourself, well, this patient will do just fine. But when you actually write out the, uh, do the measurements of leg length discrepancies and the cup abduction angle, I don't think this is acceptable anymore. And simply by having x-rays during, uh, during an anterior approach case, you can easily make those adjustments while you're doing it. Uh, and so taking it out of Varus, for example, and so you'd have outcomes and x-rays uh, that you're extremely happy with by the time you're done the case. So when you leave the operating room, you know exactly where those implants are, how they are, what the leg length and offset, and you've, you've created the, the best outcome you can um, and understanding some of these things need to be altered. Uh, now, this is an interesting ACE report that was uh, out there. It looked at similar radiographic outcomes in total hip arthroplasty using direct lateral um, uh, and a direct anterior approach. Sorry, a lateral approach and a direct anterior approach. Uh, they used 164 patients. They both had cemented acetabular components and cemented femoral components. And basically what the summary was, the two approaches were similar in their ability to obtain adequate component positioning, mantle thickness, offset, leg length discrepancy, with the exception of acetabular inclination, which was more frequently considered adequate in the direct lateral group. Now, this was surprising to me. Because in, in my hands, when I have x-rays and fluoroscopy during the case, I don't know, understand it. So I jumped into the actual paper, downloaded the paper, read it. Uh, and sure enough, they didn't use fluoroscopy or any x-ray assessment was used uh, during the anterior approach, which I think is a huge benefit of the anterior approach. 
when you actually look at the literature and uh, uh, look at intraoperative fluoroscopy, uh, when you can use that during the ant anterior approach, sure enough, this paper published in 2020 uh, with uh, um, 100 poster uh, approach patients and 100 anterior approach patients, uh, you, they had more accurate anatomic restorations of leg length, femoral offset, total offset, ideal cup abduction, and cup antiversion. And in fact, it was a very even more interesting uh, to see that there was a tendency of increasing offset and leg length in the posterior approach. And uh, in my experience, and also in this paper that um, they had also talked about, those were likely due to the fact they were trying to increase more stability using the posterior approach by doing those things. Uh, this is an ortho evidence original um, uh, paper looking at surgical approaches. It was a network meta-analysis. Uh, they basically looked at the effectiveness of anterior, posterior, uh, or the lateral approach groups. Um, this is a very, very convoluted and uh, uh, and busy slide, but uh, basically what happened here is they took 21 uh, uh, randomized control trials looking at the Harris HIPS score, 13 randomized control trials looking at uh, um, uh, visual analog scale, um, and uh, and tried to compare. And so what they basically came out with was the anterior approach uh, um, was uh, superior in terms of the Harris HIPS score, both uh, one month to three months compared to the posterior approach, and three months and 12 months the lateral approach. And uh, when you're looking at the VAS, it was up to one week ben more beneficial for the anterior versus posterior group. Now, people say, well, what's one week mean? But I really believe that that early change and early left pain function really translates throughout the whole experience of a patient. Uh, so in conclusion, the, uh, in this paper, the anterior approach demonstrated superiority over the lateral and posterior approach groups. Um, so in summary, when assessing the literature, you got to really make sure you're comparing the groups that you actually want to perform with you as a surgeon um, and give to your patients. Uh, I do believe that the ANGI approach does have benefits, um, uh, and uh, the real key here is to avoid the downsides, specifically the learning curve. And just to touch upon that before I end, uh, I do honestly believe that the learning curve now is a lot different than that published in the literature, and that... Uh, uh, in terms of in, in real life. And the reason for that is the huge supports that you can now get uh, to learn and, and bring the anterior approach into your practice in terms of courses, cadaver courses, uh, surgeon to surgeon visits, reverse, reverse surgeon to surgeon visits, um, local supports. There's so much out there now for surgeons to be able to safely uh, bring that into their practice if they feel that's uh, appropriate. Now, I only focus on pain, functional stability, and radiographic assistance, but I do believe there's more benefits than just this, but because of the time constraints, I limited to that. And thank you. That's great, Raj. I think it's a, a great summary for everybody. Um, I, I'm going to touch, uh, you know, of the one point, uh, you know, you, you focused on, on, on the, uh, the use of fluoro and, and the advantages you see with, with use of fluoro. One of the questions that's been posed is, talks about um, the increased time uh, with having fluoro set up, if there is any, in your rooms, i.e. does that affect the efficiency of, of your rooms and therefore affect your throughput or how many cases you can get done in a day uh, in your practice? I assume you're using fluoro on every case. Is that correct? I do use fluoro in every case. And, you know, even, as much as I try to, because other surgeons say, well, why do you need to do it if you've done so many? Uh, it's almost an addiction because I know exactly where everything is by the end of my case. Now, uh, good question. I, I think that has all to do with the learning curve. So currently in my practice, there is even using fluoroscopy, navigation, any of these other um, adjuncts, it does not change my surgical time. In fact, I'm, um, uh, when I looked at my uh, surgical data, um, once I surpassed uh, in my hands, it was 100 cases, but the 100 cases was in my hands was a lot different than what a current surgeon would be. Because when I started doing that, there was there was not the support that they're currently out there. Uh, but there was no there's no statistical surgical difference in terms of time or number of cases that I do a day. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, I'm going to um, move on now. I'm going to ask Ross and Steve to uh, talk about their experience uh, in Kelowna. And getting uh, getting their uh, DA program off the ground there, and, and it it certainly can be a challenge when you're sort of pioneering something within your institution. So uh, I'm looking forward to hear uh, how things went uh, in their experience, guys. All right, on. Thank you. All right. So so I'm far less polished than the uh, previous talks, uh, I must say. But I'm not used to giving uh, talks such as this. Here we go. There we go. Uh, no disclosures uh, whatsoever. Um, I, think, I don't think Steve actually does as far as uh, nothing relevant. relevant to this talk, at least. 
So um, for our practice, uh, we first started considering switch to a DAA back in 2017. Um, the major reason for it uh, was a lot of patient, patient interest. Um, even back then, a lot of, as been outlined before, a lot of literature and kind of advertising on the internet, especially through the United States, uh, about the, the joys and wonders of the DA approach. Uh, and I must say at that point, I was a, a major skeptic and uh, but you know, hear enough uh, people coming in uh, and asking about it, it kind of perks your interest a bit. Um, so that was probably the, a major driver. So uh, we ended up looking at the evidence and as outlined already, it's, it's a bit conflicting um, as far as you know, ups and downs of it, I won't belabor that. Um, and another factor was that we had a colleague that was also local uh, down uh, on the highway a little bit, instituted a program uh, in Penticton and uh, was having great, great success uh, with implementing his program. Uh, and uh, we felt that you know, it, it was a good opportunity to get on his uh, momentum to a large extent. Um, the other aspect that we thought was, you know, very useful uh, in our situation was the potential for a, an ERAS program uh, as far as getting people out of hospital uh, quickly. <clears throat> All right. The host stopped our video. Is it over here? What's going on here? Can you guys see uh, Ross and Steve? They're, they're presenting off of mine and I can't, my video's not allowing me to start. All right, all good. Okay, he'll just keep. We can see okay. the slides, guys. We can't see your faces. All right, I'll put your video on. That makes you fortunate. Yeah, you're yeah. lucky. You're lucky. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, Ross. You have such a wonderful, uh, wonderful face there. I think we need to somehow see it. Oh, yeah, there we go. Hey. <laughs> there, we go. there we go. All right, there we go. So. We want to go back a slide, I think. All right, so yeah, the ERAS stuff and uh, as far as the early recovery from anesthesia, same day discharge, uh, not requiring that, that same bed utilization um, and getting uh, throughput based on not requiring that um, uh, was a huge uh, motiva motivating factor. Uh, and personally, I thought the x-ray uh, integration like Raj uh, had already brought up uh, and that ability to really dial in and, and ensure your offset and the leg length um, cup positioning, all that was is as accurate as you could keep it. And since both of us are, uh, were relatively early in our careers uh, and hadn't been too set in our ways, we felt that changing up uh, the, uh, the practice uh, wasn't so onerous. Uh, we weren't totally dinosaurs, as it were, uh, from uh, Lisa's talk. So how we went about doing it. Um, so there was... I said before, uh, Dr. Bell down in Penticton had already uh, got a program up, in, up and running in Penticton. Um, and he had brought in, uh, I think, Dr. Sharma to talk to our health, our hospital administration and health authority about getting the program started and giving the various benefits of getting that going. So uh, we were fortunate enough to piggyback on that momentum. Um, so they ended up getting a donor for the hospital uh, from the hospital foundation that was uh, able to purchase a HANA table uh, to get the program running. Uh, and based on uh, conversations with other people starting this up, we felt that uh, would be the best uh, in our hands as far as instituting a program here uh, rather than doing it uh, with a standard operating table. So both of us ended up going to the cadaver course and uh, getting familiar with the approach on uh, people we couldn't hurt um, and uh, going th through a couple of uh, dissections with that. And uh, I had the opportunity to do a visiting uh, day with uh, Dr. Sharma in Calgary, seeing how his program was running. And uh, Dr. Sylvester ended up going out to Ontario and uh, having a similar experience with a surgeon in Mississauga. It's actually Toronto. In Toronto? Got you yeah. got it wrong? Yeah. It was Toronto. Okay, there you go. Um, so when we started to get going on this, uh, Dr. Sharma was kind enough to come uh, out here and uh, get us uh, the program up and running. Uh, so he assisted us uh, with the first eight cases over two days, uh, four apiece. Uh, and then Steve and I went on, basically assisted each other for the first 10 cases of, of the piece to kind of double up our learning uh, curve. Uh, you could see what the other surgeon was doing and get extra experience that way. Um, I think Raj had a, a slide that kind of brought this up, but as far as our patient selection for the first 30 to 40 cases, it was very, very conservative <laughs> as far as patient body habit is. 
uh, various anatomical reference points, and we were just, you know, tiptoed through the, the learning curve as, as safely as we could. Um, and as far as that aspect of it, uh, certainly, you know, Elisa brought this up as far as the learning curve and the, the patient risk uh, factor associated with it. Um, during the initial consultations for people going through this, I certainly uh, laid that out for them uh, in entirety, just to be sure that they were aware um, that if they were choosing to go ahead with this particular approach, that this was early on in our experience here. Uh, and therefore, there was likely going to be an increased risk of complications. So, it, I, which I thought was entirely appropriate, just that they knew what was actually going on. So, as we became uh, more and more comfortable with it, uh, we started expanding our kind of indications, uh, as you expect, larger patients uh, with body habitus that uh, are more kind of average, we'll say. Uh, distorted anatomy, elderly patients, uh, failed hip fractures uh, with the DHSs and, and uh, the cannulated screws, um, some basic uh, metastases and fracture care. So uh, I think uh, as we came more kind of comfortable with the approach and uh, the outcomes, uh, being enthusiastic about what we were seeing, we started broadening uh, who we were you know, using this approach for. So our current situation here, uh, we have three surgeons doing DA uh, hip replacements uh, in Kelowna now, uh, Steve, uh, myself, and uh, Dr. Kurtz. Uh, we all use the hand table for it, so none of us are using the just an off-standard operating table at this point. Uh, we had a, you know, as it was successful and the enthusiasm for it locally, we had a second donor uh, willing to purchase a DA table for the uh, for the hospital. So currently, um, you know. Uh, from my perspective, pretty much the majority of my primary surgeries are done through a DA approach, uh, simple revisions as far as a component exchange uh, and um, you know various uh, short uh, stem uh, femoral exchanges. Um, Asked tablet revisions we're starting to think about doing. Uh, I don't know if we've gotten doing that too, too uh, vigorously yet. Occasional bipolar, depending on surgical assists. Um, as far as the stability assessment, um, I think I'm the only one still uh, doing this these days, but uh, as far as taking the, uh, the boot out of the, uh, the spar and uh, doing a traditional dynamic test uh, makes me feel better. I don't think it's actually necessary. <laughs> it thinks more for me than anything else, but it makes me sleep at night. So there we go. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think how it went. So initially, <clears throat> It certainly expanded our operating time. Uh, we were around uh, one hour and a half to two hours, depending on uh, the case. Um, within the first 30 to 50 cases, that dropped uh, quite reliably to around an hour, give or take. Um, so by about six months on in, we'd returned to our previous caseload, doing four, uh, four primary joints a day. Um, and that's continuing. Um, we did four today, actually. So it's been, and I said average times, I would say somewhere between 50 to 70 minutes, depending on, uh, on you know, patient factors. Go for it. All right. Okay, we'll switch over to me. So um, in terms of the learning curve and how this actually felt to do, I'd say the first six months were considerably more stressful than uh, what we'd experienced previously when doing our surgeries. Now, I was maybe a little bit more uncomfortable with, or more, more comfortable with changing because I'd recently changed from primarily lateral to uh, drifting more towards doing a posterior approach. So things were already a little unsettled for me, but um, both of us uh, uh, definitely found ourselves thinking a little bit more the night before about what we were gonna be doing and sweating considerably more. And that wasn't just the lead, which incidentally did get uh, completely saturated on at least one occasion. <laughs> Uh, this femoral exposure tended to be the most difficult thing initially, which I don't think is a surprise to anybody who's tried this or anybody who's read about doing it. And there's also some challenges with the staff not being familiar with the techniques that we're using, uh, with the equipment that we're using, even running the table, uh, getting the appropriate x-rays and so on. Uh, after about six to 12 months, as Ross was alluding to, we're getting quite a bit more confident. Uh, the exposures were less uh, difficult. Uh, the, everything just started to click 
and to run a lot more smoothly. And the OR times, as he said, dropped considerably, which meant less time pressure on the day to get your cases done, less stress, and just a generally speaking, more tolerable experience for everybody involved. And since then, as he sort of indicated already, we've been just sort of expanding our, tech, our indications and really refining the techniques, little tricks uh, and tips that we pick up and pass on to each other and from others as well that really do make things quite a lot easier. Um, which is, of course, the case with all uh, approaches. This is just a little graph that we cooked up to show kind of a visual representation of how our case volumes actually increase. Now, keep in mind that we were very conservative initially with our patient selection, and also keep in mind that COVID has played havoc with our access to the OR. So it's difficult to really um, give an accurate representation of how things went. But Basically, this is combined numbers for us. We started late in 2018, so the numbers there are quite low. And then I would say in 2019, we still weren't doing as many people as we normally would. But even with significant OR reductions in 2020 and 2021, this, the number of people that we're doing via DA has really increased, and that's reflected in these numbers. And it definitely has become the primary approach both of us use for, I would say, 75 to 80% of our primary hip patients. We did have some complications and it's important to discuss those because everybody's going to want to know about those. We had two dislocations, one each uh, early on in our practices, one at six weeks and one immediately post-operatively and both were revised uh, and did well after that. Uh, there were femoral cra cracks uh, for them, one of which was trivial and we did not uh, repair. Uh, we had a Karai stem in that person, and they did extremely well with no problems. Uh, the others were wired, and that was not particularly difficult. I did notice a question there uh, asking about access for wiring. Uh, without going into the details of it, it's really not a problem at all. Uh, we've had a few infections, but certainly no more than we would expect for similar numbers. We're at about 600 in total uh, between the two of us at this point. Um, a couple of wound breakdowns uh, with OR debridements. We didn't have any of the uh, much discussed the trochanteric fractures, although I did manage once to put a home in directly into somebody's trochanter, but that didn't actually cause a fracture, fortunately. Uh, we had no femoral perforations, which might be due to the stems that we used. Uh, we generally use either a Karai or an Actus stem, which have a very blunt tip on the brooch, and that just really doesn't lend itself to easy femoral penetration, in our opinion. Uh, we had no major nerve palsies, femoral or otherwise. Uh, there are LFCN palsies, and pretty much everybody has some degree of that, and pretty much everybody gets better, and pretty much nobody cares one way or the other at the end of it once they've uh, recovered they're quite happy with their hip uh, we've never had any knee or ankle fractures or any other uh, uh, fractures uh, which i know have been reported in the literature and we had one transfusion that we can recall keeping in mind we're not formally gathering data but when you're trying a new approach pretty much everything that goes wrong wrong is essentially burned into your brain so it's hard to forget most of these uh, in terms of ex what went right or what we like about this, we noted right from the start an excellent acetabular exposure, uh, really very good. Uh, femoral exposure at this point especially has really been adequate for everything that we have ever needed. We cemented stems, we use cementless stems, we use relatively long stems like a cry, we use short stems like an actus and others. Uh, we've been able to wire. Uh, we've done a couple of removals, stem removals, both of which were well ingrown, I might add. Um, without any difficulty in terms of access. And we've managed in a couple of cases when it's necessary, especially for a very tight canal to get a long straight reamer down the femur, or at least I have, and that access wasn't difficult. I've never put in a really long revision stem through this approach, but based on my experience with that, I think it would be possible if you wanted to try it, provided you had the experience. Um, we really like the x-ray. We like having the access to referencing component position, offset leg length. I know we've talked about that, but especially in cases of distorted anatomy, such as say a dysplastic hip or a deep petrusio, which we've, we've done uh, several of these. It's just really nice to know exactly where everything is. And at the end of the case, to be very satisfied that everything's as good as it can be, as Raj pointed out. Uh, it definitely helps with repairing fractures uh, and uh, yes, the complex cases, distorted anatomy. Um, We've had very good success with the same day discharge program. And this was an added wrinkle because we didn't have that either when we started this. So we kind of started both programs at the same time. But, um, you know, just going along pretty standard criteria for this, we've had uh, a really good success. In fact, pretty much everybody that we earmarked to go home does manage to. Occasionally they don't. That usually has to 
do with not actually being able to get physio or somebody to see them and get them up or because it takes too long for their spinal to come out. So those are usually the things that uh, limit us. Occasionally, one of our anesthetists will prefer to give uh, uh, narcotics in their spinal and then there'll be lots of vomiting and that might hold us up too. But uh, overall, we've, we've done very well with that to the point where we're now considering and working on expanding that to a total knee program uh, as well. And then just in the anecdotal experience, this is not data, so take it with a large grain of salt, but our experience with uh, the early outcomes for our patients have been excellent. You know, you have those occasional patients when you're doing a lateral or posterior who come back to see at two weeks, that's usually when we see them the first time, and they're doing great. They're walking around, they don't have a cane, they don't have any pain, they're just delighted. That was occasionally before, now it's most of them. Um, and uh, I would say that, you know, as I said here, the top 10 outcome percent outcomes for the standard approaches is, is more or less the average of what we tend to see with, a, with an anterior. But that's, as I said, totally anecdotal. <clears throat> um, white for east. Sorry. Sorry. We are in the hospital. <laughs> Somebody's losing Code it on for east. For east. <laughs> um, so uh, then we have uh, where we're going next. So we are using a, an x-ray navigation system or trialing it. We've not had much or access to play with it. So it's a little early to make any uh, conclusions. So far it's been interesting, but it's not yet clear that we're gonna continue to use it or that it's uh, hugely uh, changing anything for us. We'd like to do some revision, uh, uh, more revisions through this approach, but we'll need to actually be able to travel easily to do that. So that hopefully will happen soon. You do need two assists and we've been toying with the idea of whether you could be doing at least bipolars with a single assist. Uh, so that's an area to examine. And then of course there's technology coming down the road, uh, robotics, uh, things that might get rid of the need for an X-ray for instance. So there's no lead and no uh, radiation for everybody. That's worth thinking about, but that's so far down the road that it's not really something that we're uh, actively pursuing at the moment. That's it. That's great, guys. I think that's uh, a good summary for everybody who, who might be considering to go down the road. So I think we're going to open things up. Uh, I'm going to try to manage the question and answer. Uh, and we do have some questions also in the, in the chat as well. So I'll try to bounce back and forth. So Ross and Steve, just some to start off with you guys. Um, one question that came up is, is, did you ever have to convert to another exposure? Um, when you guys were, were starting off down this road. So you, you basically got to a point where you could not get yourself finished. Have you ever come across that or felt like you were going to get to that point? We no. Um, sorry, I got two things going. Maybe just... Uh... All right. All right. All right. No. That's going. Good now? All right, cool. Uh, no, uh, in short, um, for the conversion to a different approach, um, I think we've managed to successfully get through uh, every case without having to convert to a different approach. Mm -hmm. Steve? Yep, no, for sure. There's definitely some uh, sphincter puckering moments uh, in the first you know, 20 to 30 cases, especially with difficult thermal exposures, but uh, we did not ever have to do that. And I think honestly, having, um, you know, a colleague or somebody else with experience helping you in those first couple of cases um, is, uh, is really helpful to, uh, to working out problems when you do come across, which you will. Okay. Um, also some questions on, on your timing. So I think you guys said 50 to 70 minutes for getting through a case. Um, uh, the question center is that your skin to skin time is that your in room time is that including anesthesia and setup when you guys are, are quoting that and how does that compare to your previous approaches skin to skin or whichever whichever variable you're uh, that, was, that was probably active time i would say for us um i think room time uh, i would say let's see today that's easy enough to figure out was probably about 90 minutes um as far as all in um for the, the four cases uh, on average today for me. Okay. Yeah, I, I would agree in general. Yeah, we don't, we have no block room here. So uh, everybody has to be brought in and get their anesthetic. Uh, there, I saw a question on there from Dr. Mastery about how long it takes to set up the x-ray. That's done in, in parallel with everything else being set up. And so it's not a significant factor or indeed a factor at all in terms of timing. Um, and yeah, we're pretty much at our pre- 
change volume. I wouldn't say it takes us less time, but I certainly wouldn't say it takes us more time on average. Yeah, I would say from uh, just trying to recall i would say maybe about 10 minutes maybe a more uh, room time um as far as uh from previous as a as a ballpark yeah okay raj what what would you think you're obviously farther down in, in experienced at this if you took one of your partners who's next door doing a lateral or posterior approach are you able to do the same amount of work number of patients in a day that they do how many cases do you do in a day yeah, I'm, I'm about the same, if not a bit more, to be honest with you. I, uh, for example, could do, uh, let's just say a standard day. So we have in Calgary standard and extended days. Um, our standard day would be uh, 8 to 3.30. Um, I could do a bilateral anterior hip and two more anterior hips, so four joints done in that period of time. Um, and an extended day, you can add another case onto it, whether it's a knee or hip or something else, whatever you want to do. Um, uh, and even potentially an, an additional one depends on what you want to do. So um, it, it really does not change in terms of my number of cases a day. In fact, with the efficiencies that we've created over time, uh, I could potentially do more, to be honest with you. Okay, that's great. Um, so I'm going to just to make note of the time. We are probably past our hour, but there's a lot of good questions here. So I'm going to just keep uh, keep things going a little bit longer and um raj this this often comes up um is uh the approach to the intraoperative fracture um uh, can you sort of talk you know, what what sorts of fractures have you seen and and how do you manage those because i think that is when people are considering the change it's one of the things that scares them i think yeah for sure and that's a really good question uh, jamie you know at the end of the day if you're going to do a surgery you're going to have complications i think that's a, one of the uh, the big highlights I learned in my fellowship, and I, I never forget uh, Dr. Nadi, who actually said that to me. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, it's true. Like, if you're going to do a surgery, you're going to have complications. The question is, how do you learn? You need to learn how to get out of those complications. So um, the most common thing is more um, perforations than actual fractures, in my experience. And, and the reason for that is really the orientation. And I think that that really has to come down to the um, uh, assisting yourself in the learning curve, you know, going to those cadaver courses, getting the experience, uh, having somebody help you out and going to see others, because you can get out of those issues uh, very easily if you, if you learn a few tricks of the trade. Uh, getting access to the femur is, you know, it's always the common question, well, how do you get access to it if you have a fracture? And it's, it's extremely, it's more straightforward than what you would think it is, only because um, a lot of surgeons put different um, surgeries in their mind as different um, approaches or, or exposures. In other words, when you do a DHS, you have full exposure of the distal femur using a direct lateral raising um, uh, vastus lateralis, for example. And then you think of the DA and you think, okay, I can only get access to the anterior part or the superior part. So what do I do? You know, I use the anterior approach now to do femoral neck fractures, plating the medial femoral neck, for example. Um, uh, to get access to it because you can get full access around it. Uh, the only difference is you just have to work in two windows. One is that proximal window where you get the anterior approach and the femoral neck. Uh, if you need to cable, those are easy. And then you got the other one just below the, um, the, the vastus ridge where you have full exposure of the full femur right down to the knee if you really needed to through, through, through a lateral base incision um, uh, that you use, for example, on a DHS. Um, uh, so, you know, at the end of the day, I think, you know, perforations are, 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 especially in the learning curve, are more common to answer your question. And the reason for that is you just have to have adequate exposure of the proximal femur and understand where uh, the calcar is in relation to the GT and, and getting down the, the canal. If not, then you'll end up perforating posteriorly. Uh, and then calcar fractures can happen with any approach and really you just got to understand how to cable it. And uh, um, uh, just like uh, like Ross has mentioned, it's pretty easy to, to put a cable around there. It's not as hard as you, you're thinking. Some other surgeon advocate, you can, put in, you can put a screw right across that medial calcar if you need to. Thanks. Um, so Lisa, I'll, I'll ask you, uh, I mean, we, we've sort of been talking, you know, largely today, posterior slash lateral and, and the DA being sort of in the new approach group, but it's not the only kind of novel approach that's out there. Um, you'll hear people talk about, you know, mini posterior or, or direct superior, which in my mind probably falls a little bit more into the comfort zone of a posterior approach surgeon, obviously um, for the mini posterior, but even the DSA. What are your thoughts on that? Is that something that surgeons, maybe that's a, 
a more familiar ground for certain people? What would you think? Yeah, so with the, um, it depends your definition of mini, right? Because some some surgeons will call a mini approach just the fact that their skin incision is small, but they still take off the piriformis versus other will call it an actual piriformis sparing. The, the, the direct superior known as the super path approach is, is the true piriformis sparing where you come up in over the top. Um, you know, again, we didn't go over that a lot in the, in the literature as there wasn't time. There, there's been no proven benefit for those much similar to the DNA. They're done less commonly. So there's even less literature with respect to that. Um, but if you are a posterior approach surgeon, um, or even a lateral approach surgeon for that matter, but if you're a posterior approach surgeon, it is certainly um, easy to convert to a posterior approach. If you get into trouble, if you get into a complication, if you need to find yourself quickly in revision territory, I have I've talked to a few surgeons who do the, uh, who did, I should say, the uh, super path approach. And that's, that's one of the things they said is having to convert with that approach to a posterior approach more than they had hoped to do. So, you know, in this world of minimally invasive approaches, there are other ones. And if you're a posterior approach surgeon, it, you're probably in more uh, familiar territory, as you say. Um, now, um, probably a question for for all of you, as you all um, sound like you do some revision work as well. Uh, one of the things that's come up is, is how important is it to go through the same approach um, that's been done if you're faced with a revision uh, situation? Um, so if somebody in your area is doing DA, Lisa, and they come in with a complication, do you try to find a DA surgeon to take care of that? Or do you manage your own, your own sort of uh, how you would manage it? What's your approach to that? I, I think it matters. I think it really depends on what the what the problem is. So you know, um, I don't have any experience with doing revisions through an anterior approach because it's not my primary approach of what I do. But one of the things I do think about when you're having these bidirect or you have a um, you know an anterior approach and then you're doing a revision through the posterior, especially if you're not a surgeon who repairs the anterior capsule, which not everyone does, right? In the anterior approach, some people just resect the whole thing and some people repair it. So, you know, I wonder in the future if we're going to have revisions through the posterior approach and then you don't have an anterior capsule and now you got to anavert that cup depending on what you're doing, are you going to force them out the front? So I wonder in the future what what that's what that's going to have. I, I, I think it would depend on on and admittedly I haven't seen many, many of these. Uh, because no one in our group does anterior. And I think probably the people who have anterior approaches largely take care of their own complications. I don't think we see a lot coming to see us, but if it was something simple that the, their referring surgeon was comfortable dealing with, then I would probably say that they should just stay with their, with their surgeon. If it's something more complex though, that needs a bit more, you know, heavy handed work, I'm going to do that through, through the posterior approach. And I think that for a revision standpoint, um, I know that there has been some papers that have been published on revisions through the anterior approach, but I really don't think that you can beat the posterior or the lateral approach for that matter. When you're doing revisions, you can see everything you need to see. It can be as extensile as possible. You can do anything through the, the posterior approach and probably the lateral too, although I don't have a lot of experience with that. Well, Raj, well, what about yourself flipping it around? You've got somebody who's referred into you with one of the more traditional approaches, are you going to revise them through a posterior or lateral or, or a DA, or does it depend on what you're dealing with? Yeah, good question. Um, and I'd like to know your thoughts on this as well. But um, at the end of the day, I think the real question is, what are we dealing with? Uh, you know, um, liner exchanges, simple last cover revisions, uh, loose femoral components, all those can be easily addressed through the anterior approach. I, I you know, I, I, I believe revision, we're talking about a different game altogether. Those are difficult cases that can get even more difficult quickly. Um, and sometimes you need plan A, B, and C on board. So um, I really have to, it's really choosing um, cases that are a bit uh, uh, more of a chip shot to, in terms of uh, what I would do through a revision, through an anterior approach versus another approach. Um, for a revision situation. So um, not to say that I don't do revisions because I, I definitely uh, do revisions through an anterior approach. Um, but uh, again, I would just have to see what, what exactly the reason is. Okay. I think that's fair. My, my approach would be similar to yours. I think that socket, simple sockets, loose stems, liners you can do. But I, I think anything where I am getting into that, this could turn bad. Certainly if there's a lot of femoral work where I have to get a well-fixed stem out, I, I would go. Uh, to a more traditional uh, exposure myself. I think the other thing I'd just really just point out there is, you know, people, you, know, you can see literature reports on extended trochanteric osteotomies and all this kind of stuff through the anterior approach. But as soon as you 
start to access that amount of dissection, it really doesn't matter which approach you use. So as a surgeon, using whatever you're most comfortable with in those scenarios is probably the best for the patient standpoint. Because uh, once you start doing excessive dissections through the anterior approach, for example, taking off tensor off the pelvis or other such things, then you could then really the benefits start to, to wash out even more. So uh, that's just my personal belief. Okay. So Ross and Steve, I'm gonna come over to you guys. Um, one of the questions that's in there is talking about, um, you know, which patients, when you're making your switch, who, which patients did you pick to, as the ones to, to start with um, as you start on that learning curve? I guess, what are the, what are the easy ones or the, the, the predictable easy ones? What things do you guys look at? Um, so the, basically the typical ones that you would, normally think of as a pretty much a chip shot from any other approach really um thin female patients generally speaking are pretty uh, tend to be pretty straightforward uh, patients with long uh, valgus uh, femoral necks um people that have a, a relatively i would say tall pelvis i guess basically they're where their asis is in relation to the center of rotation of their hip and their greater trochanter all, all those things would be certainly factored in um and so I would say early on, that was uh, certainly the bias. So if they were outside of the kind of gender slash body habits parameters, as long as the x-ray parameters look pretty routine, uh, I think that was the kind of the early kind of expansion point as far as going forward from there. But I would say the early ones, that was, uh, that was definitely the, the, the number one pick. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think the classic advice is to avoid the large muscular male with a varus short neck. And that, that really are, that's the, in my experience, those are the people that are a bit harder to just get space to work on where you're gonna have more impingement of the trochanter around the back of the uh, pelvis and behind the cup, for instance, when trying to expose the femur. Um, and that's, that's where you're gonna struggle. So if you can avoid people like that, and like Ross, I go for the uh, go for the valgus high offset type uh, slender uh, people, you're going to make your life a lot easier in the first little while. Yeah, I mean, I think those are great points. The other thing I, I teach my residents and fellows is looking at the pelvis itself. You want that skinny, narrow pelvis. You want to avoid the one with the big Mickey Mouse ears. Those are the ones that uh, it's going to struggle more getting that, getting around the corner and, and make it harder when you're, when you're first, first learning. Um, uh, for the anterior uh, surgeons doing anterior, there's been a couple questions along the STEM. Um, I don't know if you want to talk STEM trade name or STEM design. Um, Raj, do you, do you have a design that you like or a uh, feel for a certain STEM? Is there anything you look for? No, quite honestly, you can, anything you're normally comfortable. So my advice normally is you learn the approach, don't change your STEM. So whatever you're comfortable using for your STEM, that's the STEM you should use because you're comfortable on how, how you rasp it, how you fit, what the fit feel feels like. I honestly don't believe that uh, uh, changing the STEM is important. Now, the one caveat behind that is the implants that require a ream rasp system. Those are the ones that uh, you want to you know, try to not avoid. So any type of system that's a RASP only system is the one that's probably the best. Now saying that, um, I do ream distal uh, femurs if they have a type A door canal. And I think, you know what, even a RASP system, I'm going to pot distally. I would just put a wire down and just do a flexible reamer to usually my, my goal is to ream up to a size 12 reamer now. But again, if you're going to choose the implants you want, a RASP only system, whichever one you're comfortable with, is the best one to choose, is my opinion. Yeah, we'd agree with that. I think we've used a huge variety of uh, stems from, from all sorts of different manufacturers, uh, both, uh, uh, but all brooch only stems as well. So that's, that's been just fine. We haven't had a problem with any of them really. Yeah, I don't think we, as Rod was saying, we didn't really change implant choice based on our um, approach choice. We kept, we basically used the same implants going in uh, to this. And personally, I've kept going with the same implant by a large cell. So um, I don't think that, but that was definitely a approach only uh, system. Okay. So Lisa, I'll ask you, um, you've sort of taken the stance that how you're trained by your 
dinosaur mentors, I think you mentioned, which is kind of good for, for Baz. Did you hear that Baz? I'm not sure, but um, uh, can we not learn in practice? Uh, is there not a way to, to, for us to change or, or, or are you really just saying there's no benefit in your mind uh, is I guess the question I would have. Yeah, it's a great question. And I certainly don't never meant dinosaur in a, in a, in a negative way, just more meant to poke a little bit of fun at our, at our um, senior colleagues. No, I, I think that we should do, we should continue to uh, learn and to learn something different and learn something better and change the way that, that we do things. And I don't think we should ever stop doing that. That's not, you know, my stance on the, on the posterior approach doesn't come from the fact that I don't think that we can learn how to do something better. I think we absolutely can. Where my stance comes from is that I don't think Think there's enough compelling evidence to warrant a learning curve for, for these patients as small or as little. And that's as that curve may be based on people's experience. And that's what I can't get my head around necessarily is switching to something and exposing more patients to a complication for the sake of functional recovery, which, which may be better. And I'm, again, I'm not saying that, that it isn't, but that's just where I am in my practice uh, with that. And I will say that, you know, I have a lot of patients who come in at that two week mark and they're walking without canes and they're doing fantastic. Right. So I think it, it does depend on center, but uh, no. Um, so Jamie, basically just in, I would say that that's just my interpretation of the literature. I fully acknowledge that I'm a posterior trained surgeon in a posterior trained center. And I think to say that there isn't bias there would be very short Cited. I just don't think in my interpretation of the literature, there's a compelling enough reason for me to switch. That may not be true for everybody. Okay, I think I think Jamie got uh, uh, kicked off the webinar uh, for for some reason, but um, I would just want to take a second to to maybe just broach the topic of DSA a little bit. It was in our uh, in our title slide, so I apologize for those of you who uh, signed in to specifically hear a little bit more about the uh, uh, direct superior, the superpath approach. I know there's lots of places doing it up the up the street from us in in Vernon. They've all uh, changed to their same day program, uh, doing the uh, direct superior. Um, there's there's not as much literature uh, comparing the DSA uh, uh, compared to uh, some of the other uh, approaches, but uh, maybe anybody on the line, can you speak a little bit about uh, your thoughts about, uh, about implementing, um, you know, DSA, you're, 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 you're wanting to change. Should you go, should you choose DSA or should you choose DAA? I guess I'll jump into that one. I think at the end of the day, you got to ask yourself which one you want to, to jump into. Uh, certainly, there's a lot more literature published on the anterior approach versus DSA. Um, and, and part of that, you know, if you look at DSA, so I went through the whole process of learning DSA because I really wanted to, to learn about it and understand it for myself. Now, I don't, I don't perform it uh, personally in my practice because I do feel the DA is, 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 is in my interest and in my patients better. Um, and that's why I've stuck with it. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, it's all about what you what, what, what are you preserving in order to in order to um, uh, approach it. So, um, you know, IT band poster capsule to me are, are, are really the, the big issues here. Um, not necessarily some of the questions I was just kind of was, uh, looking through myself here, you know, external rotators like the internists or, uh, or piriformist, uh, you know, we just, we're about to publish a study uh, that we just completed an MRI study basically showing uh, that really the uh, internist and piriformist likely don't make the difference here. It's more the poster capsule to reduce this locations and the IT band to improve function uh, is really what you're looking at. Um, and so when I was, when I went through that learning curve, the DSA, my personal opinion was, well, the only approach to preserve poster approach, uh, sorry, IT band and poster capsule was the anterior approach. And that's why I kind of stuck with that. Now, uh, I do believe there are benefits with the DSA. Don't get me wrong. I do believe there are benefits by preserving um, that IT band. I, I, I believe that, that that does make a difference, but um, uh, those are just some of my thoughts. Raj, can I ask you a question? Um, since you, you went through training with us, um, with Brent and I, and you managed to somehow learn it despite our lack of skill of teaching. Um, and then you've done a great job teaching a bunch of people on how to do this sort of stuff. How many cases would you say a surgeon should be doing a week, a month, a year, however you want to classify that in order to consider this? Because at least I'll tell you my feeling, there's got to be a number where, you know what, it's just not enough reps to consider that do you have any feel for 
for that because I think yeah. that's important for a lot of people on the line to hear. Absolutely, and I think uh, you know at the end of the day, if you look at the literature, it's 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 pretty hilarious actually. It the ranges from ten to two hundred cases. That's that's what the what the literature says. But I think in real life and 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 in terms of now the supports that are out there, I always ask surgeons that I had the privilege of going and and, and spending some time with. Um, uh, to really commit to 20 cases. Uh, so in other words, I say to them, whatever you do, it doesn't matter how much you cry, you sweat, you hate your life, you know, you're drenching your, your, your greens through your lead. Just promise me you'll finish 20 cases because at that point in time, something happens, something clicks and it just becomes a lot more easier. And then efficiency just starts to grow after that. And that's my personal opinion. I believe that number 10 can, sorry, 20 can greatly decrease over time, especially uh, just like we heard here, we have, you know, when people do it in partnership, uh, you have more supports, you can decrease that learning curve. Uh, you can really have a lot of these extra supports that are out there as well. I honestly don't believe the answer approach is that difficult. And I, and people laugh when I say that, but I, I honestly truly believe that when I teach residents, when I teach fellows, I have the privilege of teaching them as well, uh, other surgeons, I don't believe it's difficult. It's just a different way of thinking, a different way of doing it, just like when in residency, learning something new. Uh, it's just about going through those reps and, and, and really just learning at the beginning. I honestly don't think it's that difficult. So do you think the learning curve is potentially different for residents and fellows who come through training programs versus, you know, our, our audience today that might be considering this as practice surgeons then? I think the learning curve is part of the residency. I think the learning curve is real for any approach, but I think just like, you know, me learning from you, for example, how to do a complex revision um, through a lateral approach uh, or even try to access it through a poster approach, you know, my learning curve was with you standing there slapping my hand every single time I did something wrong. So I, I think the same idea concept happens where even as a surgeon, you got to go through those reps and do it. But just like we heard here, you pick the appropriate patients, you take that time to learn it, you get the assistance that you need. I honestly don't feel it is the most difficult thing to learn. Yeah, I would agree with that too. I mean, when you're learning it in practice and you're your patients, and uh, you don't have somebody there, as Raj said, you know, waving at you and uh, maybe shouting at you, <laughs> telling you what to do. Um, it's like learning to walk a tightrope without a safety net, or at least it feels that way. I don't think it is actually that bad. And I would agree that generally speaking, it's, it's not, I think, hugely more difficult than any other approaches, but like the other approaches, there are tricks. And once you figure those out, life gets a lot easier. I, you know, we have one of our colleagues here who's not here talking today. He, he learned DA in, uh, in his residency and fellowship. And uh, for him, this was a lot easier, right? So uh, I think that uh, if it's becoming part of the teaching landscape and residents are being trained in this, that um, I, it probably doesn't become such a big deal anymore. It just becomes yet another standard approach like it, it is in other places. I, feel that. I think uh, uh, for someone like me, it's going to be uh, a heck of a lot easier today than it would have been back in uh, 2018, uh, because I have two surgeons, three surgeons now uh, who do it routinely and who usually there's one of them around every single day. That way, you know, it won't be the, the tightrope without a net. I'm going to have my safety net by the time I start it. That's for darn sure. Uh, and that's these two guys right here. So I think that that definitely will change things for a lot of people. I think that uh, the, the tough thing could really be about how do you start it in a, uh, a group of a community or non-academic center where nobody has that, that training uh, and you don't have any of the equipment. And, and these, these guys did that uh, very well. And that's really why I wanted to highlight uh, the successes that they had. Had, uh, because they found mentors, uh, they they trained in cadaver courses, uh, they got the equipment, and then and then they got those mentors to come out here. Uh, and I think as a pair, uh, I'm speaking on uh, on their behalf right now. But as a pair, having a having a second person there, I think is 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 a, a extremely helpful uh, because you talk your way through the cases. I mean, we do that with most complex cases here. We'll have two of us around in terms of trauma, uh, multi leg knees, all this stuff. Uh, and and having that second person around is is a huge help in any any complex case or new case. If if you don't mind, I'm going to turn the table around on on Jamie here for a second. Uh, Jamie, you might be asking if you can comment on, because I think one big thing to talk about, and I personally do on table and off table, but I think you as doing majority off table, in other words, a standard table, you don't need the orthopedic table, if you can comment on that, because I think that's an important aspect to it, because I don't think you necessarily need that at the beginning or, or, or at all, 
um, depends on how you how you feel about it. So I don't know if you can just yeah. take a few minutes yeah, to comment I, on that. I, I've actually um, I've never done a, um, one of my own patients on on a traction table. I've only ever done one of my own patients on a on a free table. Um, when I when I learned, I, I I went and saw some people who are using a Hannah table. I think that you can do it either way. Um, the if you're you you're your extra body or assistant. I mean, I, I, for me to do it, I can do it with just one assistant on a regular table. That's fine. For me to teach it, it's a little hard for me to teach one fellow without another pair of hands because I can't see as well if I'm standing in the pure assistant position. Uh, but I think you can do, I don't think the table changes, um, makes it easier necessarily. I think it's a little bit different in terms of how you do it. You, my, my feeling is I have to be a little more meticulous with my femoral releases to get the femur exposed um, because I don't have any extra kind of the hydraulic power of a hook to, to kind of pull things, pull things up. But uh, in terms of why I did it that way, when we were first embarking down DA, Brent Lanting, my the other partner in London who does it, he was doing it on the table and we did it actually for educational purposes uh, to say, okay, if we can teach our residents and fellows both techniques, I mean, these uh, Ross and Steve really, you know, we're lucky that they were able to get a donor and then another donor not everybody's going to be able to get that donor. So I like to be able to teach people how to do it. So it, there's some differences in how I might go about it, but overall, I think you can get a great outcome either way. Yeah. I um, think that's an important, important aspect. So I think a lot of the question always comes out to, well, do I need to find a donor to start this thing, to learn this thing? I think the answer, you know, that you nicely pointed out is the answer is no, uh, I don't think you need that. And I, I truly don't because now, even a lot of my after hours, the, the hemis that I do for hip fractures, they're all through a uh, standard table uh, approach. And I, I find that uh, um, quite easy. But anyways, uh, I, I think it's an important point to bring up. So I will, I just did want to circle back one thing sort of Lane touched on. And I, I think Ross and Steve, you guys did a great job. And, you know, for the people listening tonight, I think if you are going to go down this road, I like how you described how, how you did it. You know, at least I, I was surprised there is some papers out there about the, you know, the going to the one day course and the, the disastrous outcomes from going to the one day course, you know, nine times the, uh, the fracture rates and these sorts of things. So it's not a one day course thing. I think you need to get your mentors. You need to, you need to do some courses. You need to watch somebody do it. And then having somebody come with you that's experienced that can can help you through that. I think that's your path to success. So I, I like how Ross and Steve outlined that because just going to one of the courses that the company sponsors isn't going to be enough uh, for you to learn this. Uh, so Lisa, I think and Ron, that's, I think that's any I think that's any approach too. You know, whether it be the DSA where it might be a little bit uh, easier approach to 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 switch over to. I know I spoke with the uh, the guys who are doing it in Vernon and and from a from a uh, quote unquote mini posterior where you don't get into the IT, IT band as best uh, uh, as you can. Um, you know, there's there's not a huge, huge jump uh, there. And if I want chose that I wanted to go and do that one, I would find my same mentors and find the same um, uh, same experiences. So so be it changing from, I recently changed from a, a lateral to a, to a posterior last year. And then it's like, okay, am I gonna change again? But it, all of it has to do with, with finding the appropriate um, uh, the appropriate way to do it, finding those people who have been doing it for a while, doing it well, uh, and then and then using using your peers, using uh, using your your orthopedic networks in your towns, cities, uh, provinces, or or the country. Ross and Steve are over here busy trying to type in as many answers as they can into the into the chat box. So have a look back at that if you put one in there. I do appreciate them uh, them doing that next to me here. So Raj, I'm gonna I'm gonna build on some or touch on go after you for something you just said, um, and it's in the question in the chat there. It's about doing it on your hemi arthroplasties, and I'll just I'll just throw my bias out there. I, I I feel those patients cannot afford a mistake in another operation, and so I I actually don't like having people say I'm gonna give it a whirl on the on the hip fracture patients. Um, so you just said you do them that way. So tell me tell me about that. Yeah, I, I, so, you know, this is always a debatable topic, especially people who uh, are, are well versed in doing it. So 50%, I would say, say, don't go after them. Some people say go after them. Um, I, I honestly think they, and this is my personal bias, I'm going to put it out there. 
um, that I don't think those should be the first patients that you do. I think those should be kind of the last patients that you do. They're osteoporotic patients to start with. I do a lot of cementing in terms of those, those type of uh, fracture patients in the first place. Um, so if you're, if you're going to go walk that path, I, I personally think I agree with you. These are patients that have one, one surgery operation. I think that's 100% accomplishable through an anterior approach with the hemiarthroplasty. But I think you really got to look and ask yourself, what is that bone quality and make sure you do uh, the appropriate. And that's a whole different topic of terms of cementing, not cementing, but that's my bias in terms of cementing wise. So uh, in my only opinion on this, I would say you choose those ones that you heard already, you know, the, the ones that are a little bit easier. Um, uh, patients, you select those patients first, you do them in a controlled environment, uh, and then you expand from there. Okay. Um, I think we've, we're typing as many of these answers uh, as we can. Um, Lisa and Raj, is, are we just talking about the same approach? Is, is the anterior approach um, just a posterior approach through the front? Is it really the same? Is that why the is that why Lisa the data seems very similar other than the dislocation seems to be different? So to me that means there must be something different. I so. I think I think there is something different. I don't think they are the, the same approach. I will say in in what I've observed in some of the anterior approaches that I've um, that I've seen. Um, there's more, uh, at least this is with the, the off table experience, um, but with the on table too. Uh, and again, I haven't done this with me watching. Um, there was more um, kind of dissectional on that, that posterior superior capsule and, and probably piriformis than I thought was necessary. But I mean, you are keeping that entire posterior capsule intact, really. Like you're not really violating that, I think, in, in a meaningful way. Uh, I do think that they are different approaches. Um, I, I think that there is some bias to be taken in with it, though, because when you look at um, programs that are starting with the anterior approach, um, you look also that the same change and same day discharge and um, institutional changes for pain control pathways and everything tends to follow suit at the same time. And so, you know, you have to really consider that effect in the anterior patients overall. Um, anyways, I won't, I won't belabor that point overall because I know we're, we're, running, we're running short on time. I, I do think they are different approaches and I do think that's why there are subtle differences in, in, those, in those first time periods. Yeah, I mean, ten degree. Yeah, yeah. So in my opinion, again, it comes down to the two aspects that I talked about: IT band sparing and posterior capsule. So I think the two of those make a big difference, and that's probably what the difference you see that early period. And I honestly believe the trouble is we don't have that that study out there, and I've been trying to rattle my head on how I can capture that in a study that we can do. But that difference in early functional changes by preserving that that IT band uh, can it really allows patients to get mobilizing. Uh, quicker, which we've seen in some of the talks here, uh, which translates and continues on for the rest of their experience. And so it's not that I'm comparing someone at three months or a year, how they're doing, because we know hips do well. Um, but it's really what that early difference does and how that translates for the rest of their experience is important. And the poster capsule, I'm not going to keep belaboring that point, but I think that's the major difference in the dislocation. Uh, and so if you preserve the poster capsule and IT band, I see that's where you find that early functional difference between poster and anterior. And I think it's that early difference that makes a difference in the rest of their experience for the patient because you're, so you're sparing the abductors, which is, I think is the important part in terms of the functional. One last question, I think, um, uh, before we start to, to wind things up. Raj, I'm going to ask you, I find a lot of people are, are considering an approach switch because they feel pressure to outpatient surgery. So do you have, do we have to do a different approach to, is this required DSA, DA, whatever, to, to get people out as outpatients? I personally think that might no. be the wrong, that's the wrong no. thinking for this. So yeah, so I think the question should be, whether you want to learn a new approach for the benefits of the approach, not to achieve necessarily the length of stay. Now, I, I brought that one slide up in my in my talk, but that's a, that's a talk that you can blow up into a half an hour talk easily because by just uh, doing multimodal analgesia, having a strong protocol, uh, creating um, the, the patient experience, you can achieve uh, same day surgery regardless of which, which uh, operation you want to do, whether that's posterior, lateral, anterior, DSA, doesn't matter. Um, now, to achieve uh, what I believe is different methods to reduce pain, reduce the amounts of pain the patient has, reduce the narcotics, and therefore help in terms of nausea, vomiting, postural hypotension, and things like that, 
I do believe it does help you get to that point. But to, to answer your question directly, I would say no. If your goal is to, re, to have decreased length of stay, the, it's not necessary to change your approach. If you want to achieve the benefits of the different approaches, I think that's the reason why you, you start to walk the path to begin with. Well, I think uh, we've had some great presentations and, and some excellent discussion. We, we're now sort of 40 minutes on the question and answer. So Lane, I think uh, I'll, I'll turn it back to you for some final thoughts. Yeah, thank you everybody uh, for attending. And I know we're quite far over, but clearly this uh, um, this broached a lot of uh, questions. And I'm sorry if we didn't get to all the uh, all the questions. Uh, there will be uh, some emails sent out in the next uh, a few days with some of the the evidence uh, from ortho evidence. And and remember, this is a accredited webinar, so you are entitled to a, um, an hour of CME credits. Uh, to do so, you'll have to fill out your evaluation form. That'll come uh, tomorrow if you're uh, were registered. Um, and uh, and also there's going to be a recording of this on the COA's YouTube page. So um, hopefully this was a, this was a, a good topic. I really appreciate all the panelists, uh, all the time you spent uh, going through there. I think this is going to be, a, despite the, the the crazy amount of literature that says I don't know, I think that this topic is going to continue to 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 present itself, especially for someone like me who is. Uh, not keen on changing, but I, I do feel as though I'm, I'm losing patience um, and I'm not sure, you know, uh, um, uh, what these guys think in terms of whether or not I truly am, but it is a conversation I consistently have probably at least once per office that, uh, that I either have to talk somebody out of the DA and then they're, uh, they're, they're upset with me uh, or um, have to let them, uh, let them go. Um, so again, I appreciate everything. Thank you to the COA, uh, ortho evidence, as well as, uh, the, uh, Canadian Arthros arthroplasty society. This is, uh, this has been a, a lot of fun and, uh, we look forward to, uh, to seeing you back for, for another one. So thank you, panelists, if you're all there. Um, maybe I can stop sharing my screen. There's a few people hanging around, but I think it's mostly the panelists. And we're going to maybe take a photo if we can. Still got 30 on the... Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, guys. I know there's a few people still.